Okay. Jay Snelson, the creator of the V50 Lectures. Peter Fleming has been involved with uh, V50 since the uh, beginning, since the early 60s. Peter Boss is the author of the um, idea of insurance companies replacing the political state, being redesigned so that they can replace the political state. Alvin Loai, uh, great friend of um, Andrew Galambos, co-author of The Definition of Property. Spencer McCallum, of course, the... Uh, um, uh, world leading figure in the idea of private cities. This is a heavyweight panel here. Um, pardon me? Yes, that's right. And Alvin, I, that's, uh, that's a good place to start. You're, you told me this is a reunion of sorts. What else this is, besides a panel, is a reunion of the class of 1964 entitled Roots of Freedom in Primitive Society and Prospects of Flower. Guest lecturer, Spencer Heath McCallum. Uh, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, sponsored by the Free Enterprise Institute. We were all there. It's the first time any of us had ever heard of the prospects of voluntary society. Because at that time, the Free Enterprise Institute was still grappling with politics. This guy <laughs> gave, his, gave his thesis, and that's what turned us on. So this is a, a class reunion. Thank you. Wow. So what we're talking about here is there's no need for a political state at all. Um, cities can be private. Cities can be owned by uh, individuals, just like a shopping center is owned today. And um, Jay, could you explain that concept? Um, tell people what, it, what we're talking about when we say private cities. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, don't get me started. <laughs> uh, I always have a problem, uh, you know, can I cut it off in a half an hour or an hour? Or, um, I was first introduced to this idea through Spencer McCallum and his uh, grandfather, Spencer Heath, and one of the least known important books of the last century is Citadel Market and Altar by uh, Spencer's grandfather, Spencer Heath, in which he set forth the concept of proprietary <coughs> communities as an alternative to the state. And Spencer, of course, being the leading expert on that, could explain it far better than I can. However, uh, until you realize that there's something wrong with what we got. What Spencer and his grandfather were doing has little impact. You know, why do we need this? What's wrong with what we got? It's like somebody, for example, saying in uh, 1913, uh, well, you know, this Federal Reserve system could go wacko and we could have inflation and all kinds of problems. Well, in 1913, uh, come on, give me a break. You know, you don't, so they don't, they don't know there's a problem. So this provides a solution, but it only has impact when you know what the problem is. And essentially what the proprietary community or what Spencer now calls, tell me, he doesn't like that term anymore. The entrepreneurial community. Entrepreneurial community. I might have an argument with Spencer on that because I've spent 40 years trying to show the importance of what Spencer Heath and his grandson uh, Spencer McCallan uh, have done, have put forth. And I always call it the proprietary community, so I've got a big investment in that term. <laughs> You've got a lot of work ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if he wants to change the name of it, I don't have any problem with that. But, but, uh, but I'll let him and others explain uh, how this uh, simple concept operates, the utility, the morality, the equity of it, uh, has no peer, and it's essentially, and I've said this before, and I'll keep, you, uh, because I call it the proprietary community, I'll keep using that term at least because that's the one I'm familiar with. I'll just say this and I'll pass the microphone on. And that is, and I've said this to all of my people in all of my seminars, the proprietary community is the wave of the future or there is no future. It completely obsoletes the state in, 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 in its totality. 
So what else I can say about that? I don't know. I'll pass this on to... Uh, Peter Boss. There's two Peters here, Peter Fleming and Peter Boss. So, um, um, okay, Boss. <laughs> the three concepts, the theme of Libertopia today is um, the technology required to get to stateless freedom. Um, three important technologies are private money system, insurance, and the private city. Um, Peter, um, have you, do you have any thoughts about um, how private insurance can operate in a private city? In two seconds. <laughs> Actually, um, I want to start out by saying that the crisis that we will be facing will create a number of opportunities for private communities to be developed. Uh, Greece, for example, is selling islands right now. Uh, I don't think they sell sovereignty yet, but I think for a price in the future, I think it will be very possible to get uh, sufficient real estate to establish a proprietary community Hong Kong, Singapore, somewhere, Dubai. I think this is doable, it's feasible financially, uh, and I think the opportunity is coming very close at hand. I have done some work on it. We need about eight square miles, which is, a, if I go through some of the communities, I'm not answering the question. <laughs> um, for example, the um, Manhattan Island is 23 square miles. Um, Monaco, 1.2 square miles. There's 14,000 inhabitants. Vatican City, uh, City is 0.17 square miles. Hong Kong Island is 34 square miles. Liechtenstein is 62 square miles, except it has no ocean, no water access. Uh, Belize is, is much bigger. Dubai is 24 square miles. If, if you're looking at the future proprietary community, I think eight square miles would be sufficient to establish a number of things, and that will relate them to the insurance thing. The financial center is number one. We're going to run into a worldwide situation of deficit uh, fired money uh, exploding. Uh, interim, we might have some gold and silver, but the ultimate of the virtual money and cyberspace money has to be established somewhere outside of the United States legal tender laws and so forth that would immediately get on, upon uh, backfire the system of trying to implement it here. So the issue of establishing pro pro uh, proprietary community somewhere would be very essential with regard to uh, starting a virtual uh, money system uh, that I was explaining or talked about yesterday uh, and uh, that would have a worldwide implication. Today um, we have reached $4 trillion of, of money exchange, going all virtual money going across the world. The trading worldwide on money is $4 trillion today. It's a huge business. So one of the opportunities we have is banking. The other one, of course, is hotels and, and tourism. The other one is established business. For example, in Liechtenstein and in currently in Switzerland, they're all competing to lower their tax rates, and they are attracting the headquarters of all kinds of businesses worldwide. And that's a tremendous business opportunity, uh, and it doesn't take much real estate again. And then finally, of course, we have all the uh, technology in place now to provide energy and water. The, oh, to, sorry. Did you miss all of that in the back? Okay. <laughs> We currently now have available energy uh, uh, sources, and I'm not talking about solar or wind or anything like that, uh, which does not support any technological-based industrial society. I'm talking about small nuclear modular nuclear power plants of the size of about 25 to 50 megawatts, which may, can be transported uh, by rail, uh, can be impl implemented modularly, and in conjunction with desalination plants, we would have plenty of water and energy available anywhere on a very small area and very low cost. We're talking like five cents a kilowatt hour. 
uh, with these plants. We're talking water like about a couple of dollars per thousand gallons. It is unbelievable. And so, and then of course, the next part of the uh, requirement would be for the community development, that people live and so forth, and so all tied in. Now part of that, of course, would be attracting also the insurance industry worldwide and the implementation of proprietary management uh, using the insurance concept. Um, Alvin, um, could you say something about the scientific basis of uh, Spencer McCallum's work? Well, we're, uh, the guests are inhabitants or momentary citizens of a proprietary community right here and now. Unfortunately, the Hilton Hotels, Hilton Hotels doesn't realize fully what they've got here. But it works. We're all here, voluntary uh, occupants, and they are voluntary purveyors of the hospitality, and it works very well. So as an observational case at point, uh, it's not just here, but hotels all over this town and all over the world are offering some protection for the state momentarily while you're a guest here. They're taking the brunt of all the risks of exposure to a state-provided services uh, while you're under their protection. So here's an observational corroboration of the strength of the theory of entrepreneurial community. But Spencer made the point, which may not have come across as emphatically as it should, is that entrepreneurial community is a business and the occupants are all customers as opposed to subdivision, which most of us are familiar with because that's the only way we own our land that we stand on. We're, as own landowners, are simply uh, co uh, consumers of, uh, or occupants of, of a fiefdom that we're trying to hold, uh, stave off invasion by the state and other predators. So consider the sanctuary here for the moment, which we were all enjoying, as a, as a case in point. Thank you. Um, so there's competition between private cities uh, and that it's going to create um, uh, imaginative, artistic cities. Peter Fleming is a literary agent. He's been working in Hollywood forever. And uh, do you have any um, ideas on the uh, artistic angle? Well, having been a, uh, an agent that roamed around every day to all the studios all over the city, I was one of the first conscious beneficiaries of the proprietary aspect of each studio. Each studio was run, you know, often here they were run like kingdoms, but uh, that, that isn't really true. Uh, they, they, uh, but for the, uh, the unions uh, and uh, the Communist Party, they were political free. The, the, the entity was beautifully guarded. Uh, they knew who you were when you came in and when you went. That you knew the terms of going there if you worked there. You knew the terms, as, as I did as a, as a uh, drive-on agent going everywhere every day. Uh, in fact, uh, Alvin's example of the hotel here is only part of the story. This is part of Universal Pictures' giant, multi-acre proprietary community, which I spent a lot of time in back in the old days. Uh, and uh, so I, uh, ever since I met Spencer and ever since I knew of Spencer Heath's work, I. I was enjoying the proprietariness of the things I was doing tremendously. Even the networks were proprietary smaller. They didn't have back lots, but they had acres, acres and acres, and they had lots of people. And uh, I've always enjoyed the piece of contract. It's exactly what those all are, except for a few socialistic, horrible things that uh, interfere in showbiz. But that's changing, too. So I, I, I've lived a happier life knowing what came out of the, the heat of the McCallum uh, uh, wealth of knowledge. Uh, and I've, I've enjoyed uh, Peter's advancement, his own direction. He's taking it and now another one. And, and uh, this, this is where it's really going. Uh, as Peter says, uh, Tom Paine wrote Common Sense, which told everybody of, of many different attitudes in the colonies that uh, 
the, uh, uh, we don't need a king anymore. No one had ever thought of that before. We don't need a monarchy. And now what, what we're all saying here is we don't need a government anymore. Uh, a, another step ahead. And uh, there's so many proprietary advancements have been made that we've all enjoyed without knowing it, that we're almost in place. Uh, the technology will put us in any one of the places that Peter's been thinking about for uh, starting a new community. The technology makes it happen. Dubai is almost that kind of a place overnight. So it's an exciting life to know that we don't have to have uh, predators tearing our door down because they don't like that we gave up our life's work to them or that we didn't give enough up to them in tax. And I loved uh, Spencer's word about uh, people cannot uh, uh, entertain the atrocities that they suffer. Uh, they cannot entertain the, the atrocity. You can't see it unless they find or you show them an alternative. It is can't, you, they can't see an alternative, period. Uh, I know in the, I've been in real estate for 25 years and I know that I can't tell a buyer that that wall could be open to a beautiful big double door that will show you the entire ocean. They can't see it unless it's there. And that's the perfect analogy to uh, your opening statement. Jay, in the V50 lectures um, about 35 years ago, 40 years ago, you had a um, great description of um, the, uh, the private city. You talked about cruise ships. You talked about the cruise ships standing on their end, turning into cities, buildings. Wondering, can you, uh, can you remember that? Can you repeat it here? I mean, I know it's only been 40 years since you've done it. <laughs> well, the concept uh, comes from Spencer Heath. How many of you read, uh, have read uh, Citadel Market and Altar? That's quite a, that's quite a, a large number. And, um, and I know uh, Spencer can correct me if I have some of the detail because he uh, helped his father edit, or grandfather edit the book. So, um, but essentially one of the concepts was uh, the illustration of an ocean liner. And on an ocean liner, First of all, no one requires us to go on the ocean liner. We earn into a contract with the steamship company. They provide us room number 27. And uh, they tell you, in addition for the fee, we're going to have three meals a day. There's going to be a buffet at midnight. Uh, and uh, if you get sick, we have a physician to take care of you. Um, if uh, you spill ketchup on your suit, we have a cleaners to take care of that. Uh, we, you can do your hair. Uh, we have all of these services. We have a full library of books. Uh, and uh, we have motion picture entertainment. And the beauty of this is that it's all run under the proprietary leadership of a single uh, entrepreneur or essentially a company is running this. And there's all kinds of services that they provide. In addition to this, they make sure that the captain knows how to get from point A to point B safely. This is good. And of course, from their end of it, they don't want to wreck the ship because that's going to hurt their, uh, you know, their bottom line for profit. So we have essentially a small city that's operating. If somebody gets rowdy, and uh, it's causing problems or what have you, um, uh, in some way uh, destroying the ship's property or harassing uh, other people who are on the ship. The ship uh, has a security. They call in the security people and they deal with it. So essentially, the beauty of this thing is, on a small scale, is that the entire operation flows beautifully without glitches, without problems, and whatever problems there are can be easily dealt with, not by the state, not by the gunman, but essentially the authority of the captain and his crew to deal with any problems. When you're on this cruise, you feel safe. You're not worried about uh, getting mugged or 
or, or what have you. And it's an example of a, a uh, what I keep calling a proprietary community. Uh, it's uh, a profit-seeking mechanism where the goal is to make profit by preventing you from having problems such as theft, all these other things. And it's a beautiful example of a win-win community. Everybody wins. There's no losers. And uh, so if the value of this concept is, and the hotel is another example that Spencer Heath used, the same thing, we have all of these services in this hotel that you would have on a cruise liner. And uh, again, it's under proprietary administration. One of the key concepts that Spencer Heath and Spencer McCallum has emphasized is the whole idea of having a single proprietary administrator, entrepreneur, whatever you want to call them, who entrepreneurs an entire community. And if you can entrepreneur a community of 25,000 people, and they get together, and there's a dispute resolution. It's all done by the proprietors. Uh, if you can do 25,000, there's no reason in principle why you can't do 50,000. If you can do 50,000, you can do 100,000. You can do a million. There, there's nothing to diminish the scope and scale of this contractual arrangement. And so it shows the whole advantage, for example, of not uh, fractionalizing the land, but having large land masses where there's a proprietor. You don't own the land. And this is a huge value in not owning the land, as the proprietor owns the land, and they deal with the administration of the property for everybody's benefit and everybody's mutual profit. It's a it's a it's a win-win concept. Now. Spencer, who's the leading expert on this, uh, I'm sure will have something to say about it. Well, Spencer, we've had a whole bunch of guys here who've taken your idea and run with it. And uh, granddad's idea, really. Well, your granddad's idea, and so you've been running with it, too. Well, do you have any comments on... Um, how they've uh, modified your idea, how they've mutated idea, and how it's developing. Yeah. We've been talking about this being my idea, my granddad's <laughs> idea, and so on. You, you already have a mic on you. Oh, well, already do. Of course. <laughs> um, I might just uh, throw out here, because it's kind of of interest, uh, how I came into this world. Uh, my, uh, my granddad in 1930, and visiting my folks, and my mother was crying, and so well, dear, what is the matter? Boo hoo, Crocker says we can't afford another baby. And this was 1930, you see, in bad times. And he went out of the room, came back a little bit later with a check for $1,000. Now, in 1930, that was a lot of money. He said, well, it's home. So I was bought and paid for. <laughs> <laughs> I would name Spencer Heath McCallum after him. Then later on, as I began to grow up, uh, I, I felt a closeness with him and his ideas and worked closely with him. And I was the only one in the entire family that could get along with this old man. <laughs> and he said several times, it was the best investment he ever made. He's going to be one. He's going to be happy with the I think we should uh, get some questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to hand you the microphone. Ah! Oh, thank you. Be careful. Oh, that might be careful. I may have to. Why don't you come out front and ask questions out here? Oh, yeah. okay. Otherwise, you get feedback. Yeah. Yeah. This is the first chance. I, uh, please talk into the mic. Oh, this is the first chance I had to ask a uh, strictly technical question. I'd like to ask Peter Voss. You were mentioning uh, portable uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, have you formed any opinions as to the feasibility of the? Uh, Thorium uh, liquid salt uh, uh, reactor? Uh, 
Um, Enter the microphone, please. Enter the mic. No, right now, not at this particular. That's Actually, it's not for right now, at this particular minute. Uh, I've just been involved uh, in energy for quite a long time, actually. Uh, I've been in charge of the national program on new energy resources. But uh, my main focus, I've looked at everything, I've seen everything. Uh, ocean thermos, you, you, you can't imagine how many proposals you get. But it finally boils down to the very few attractive things that are immediately available. And what I'm really looking at is what is really available. And uh, uh, the modular concept in nuclear, of safe nuclear, is the, the, the attractive way to go at the present time. Because you can transport it by rail, ship, easily, install it modularly, and things like that. And we're just talking about the baker technology. Anything you go beyond, you have to invest a lot more capital in, and, and uh, uh, typically, what makes economic sense is what is being developed and what's readily available. And so, other than that, I have no comment. Do you have any well, comment on that one? Yeah, I, I, I could, I could uh, address that, that uh, idea of... Talk closer to the mic. closer? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, those of you who may not be familiar with thorium as one of the elements is an alternative to uranium as a fissile material for uh, for fission uh, produ produced nuclear energy. Thorium has not been developed except possibly in India uh, because it's not a route to weapons. So in this country it was never considered as a reactor material because there was no route to weapon material to a weapon system from thorium and it's therefore much cheaper and much less bureaucratized as a raw material and, and is and in fact a very uh, attractive route to producing modular small modular nuclear reactors because it would probably for a long time be unencumbered by regulation in other parts of the world in this part of the world, I'm not sure you could escape the, the uh, province of the state, but in, you might find a hospitable environment in some place in India, for instance, because it's a local material. I want to also say that uh, entrepreneurial communities have to have, they don't just come out of thin air, just because there may be a demand for tenancy to operate a business and uh, have a place to run your life free of bureaucratic interference. But the, the community has to have some roots. And Peter mentioned energy and water as being important. I would like to emphasize that, that without energy and water as, as fundamental roots or community services, it's very difficult to establish a place to be. And the opportunity to develop an, an energy source using a nuclear fission is a very attractive route to doing this because it does not involve transportation but only once. And uh, it doesn't require transportation periodically for even logistics. So, and once you have energy, you've got water, you've got whatever. When you tell someone uh, who's not oriented like we are that uh, you don't need a state, um, they think you're crazy. The first thing they say, the first question they have is, who's going to build the roads? Um, so Jay, who's going to build the roads? <laughs> Spencer has a comment. Well, I'm sure all of us could, could comment, comment on that. Um, one of the big problems that the state has brought in is the construction of roads. Uh, that's a huge problem. It's created all kinds of displacements. Whenever the state does anything at all, people do things that they would not have done otherwise. So the state always causes what I call regressive domino effects. It doesn't matter what they do. It's a mistake. It's a blunder. And it always accomplishes essentially the exact opposite of what is intended. So the most innocent thing that we think the state is doing, that well, you know, Post office, you know, that, that, that must be good. Or public libraries, you know, well, surely that's a good thing. Public roads, 
How could we possibly get from point A to point B without public roads? And so there are all kinds of problems. For example, uh, the exodus into the suburbs after World War II was subsidized by the states by building roads. We now have roads that may not have been built in a free market. We don't know, but not, maybe not likely. And so you have an unnatural exodus because they can get out to the hinterland or out in the country and land is cheap. We can build a house for uh, half the price as in downtown or whatever. So you have people doing things that they would not be doing in a free society. Or if they were doing it, it would be under other circumstances. And the roads, of course, if there's any road in a free society, it has to be built by a proprietary interest of some kind. There's because there can't it can't be built any other way. And so you have this exodus from the city. As a result of that, you have other things going on. The state is uh, have, have, has zoning laws. All of these things cause people to do things that they would not have been doing in a free society. And but you have to take all of these interactions into consideration in order to really understand what's going on. So we have uh, people making an exodus from the city. This is increasing uh, 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 property values or, or, or being lowered possibly. Uh, this may contribute to slums and very, various other problems that drive and crime, driving more and more people away from the city. All because the state started building these roads that simply were not a market venture. And so the idea of actually building a road and making a profit, that, that's where, in fact, somebody gave, some, one of the speakers here gave a, a talk on, I didn't hear it, I didn't hear it, but there was a, somebody gave a talk on private enterprise road building. But, you know, the concept is very simple. If you want to get from point A to point B, and uh, there are several ways to do it. You can do mass transit, for example. Uh, at the turn of the century, this, the county of Los Angeles had the world's largest mass transit system. It was the old red car. You could go from Santa Monica to Newport Beach for a dime. For a dime. It was, uh, and the streetcars were quite relatively quiet. They were, they didn't pollute. They run, uh, they were run, uh, powered by electric motors. And uh, so we had this marvelous uh, rapid transit system in Los, Greater Los Angeles County, uh, which was eventually all uprooted by the state. And other, I won't go into the whole thing. But I'll end here because I'll just keep going on and on and on. But <laughs> maybe I've already gone too so far, but. The idea of building a road for a profit is a very simple thing. It's, it's, this is not rocket science. There's any number of ways to pay for it. You pay for usage, and that means uh, you know there's a, a market concept. It's win-win for mutual profit. And uh, if the market says we want a road from A to B, somebody builds it, looking for a profit. It's not it's not a difficult concept. Yeah. I'd like to comment on that. Question often comes up, well, don't you need eminent domain to lay out a route? Uh, and the interesting case of the El Paso Gas Company, at the turn of the century, they laid out a lot of routes of, of gas lines, and they never used eminent domain. Do you know how they did it? In that case, and there may be other ways too that they might have done. But what they did, they set out the two points that they wanted to connect, and then worked out three alternative routes that any one of which would work. And then they left the word out to the landowners, property owners, along all three routes. And we will deal with the first group that comes together with the uh, <laughs> with the options for their route. And then they step back and let the landowners pressure their neighbors and all, come on, come on, we got to do this, we got to get money for our rights of ways and so on. And they never had a problem. Brilliant. That's great. That's a great story. That's a great story.
That's the way it is. Let me add but, one, to, one to that, if I may, quickly. And those of you who most know this, one of the great American entrepreneurs that's relatively obscure is James Hill, who built the Great Northern Railroad. And the difference between the Great Northern Railroad and all the other railroads is that he built this railroad. It was a complete proprietary venture. They did not eminent, eminent domain one foot of land. And it was the best built railroad. And he had a long-term attitude. He said, I want to build the best railroad, but we have to put in the highest grade steel. We got to put in the best beds and so forth, on and on and on. It was a magnificent railroad. The other guys, Central Pacific, Southern Pacific, all these guys were subsidized by the state and all about the land grants and all of this the right away. And their goal was not a market phenomenon. They said, we've got to get from point A to B fast and complete this thing without consideration for the long-term idea of profits. And so uh, these roads began to deteriorate much more rapidly than did the Great Northern. But, but James Hill proved that because a railroad is a road, right? We're talking about roads, OK? Uh, he proved that this could be done. And it's one of those cases where if he hadn't done it, everybody said, well, you can't do that. Well, he, it was done. So you might read a little bit about it. Hill and the Great Northern. It's a, it's a marvelous story of the victory of private enterprise uh, as the superior alternative always to everything the state ever does, ever thought of doing, can do, what have you, ad nauseum. Let's get uh, another question from the audience here. <coughs> Butler? Have him come up. Um, <coughs> I'd like to just follow up on this last question, because whenever I'm asked this question by my students or anyone else, you know, how in a stateless society could you have fill in the blank? My response has always been, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have any idea. Um, I'm not the new Mr. Wizard. I'm not, I'm not replacing the state in some fashion. I think there are hundreds of millions and, and worldwide even billions of people who in the exercise of their self-interest will figure out a lot of things. And they'll figure out a lot of different ways to build roads and libraries and, and everything else. My first introduction, serious introduction to uh, economics came when I was uh, in law school. And I studied under uh, Aaron Director, who was Milton Friedman's uh, brother-in-law. Uh, Aaron was always fond of referring to Milton as my New Deal brother-in-law. And uh, he, he he would make the statement, you know, that uh, anything that the government does or anything that we would like to have them do can be and has been done in the market. And from that point on, the students just freaked out. It's all true. By the way, uh, James J. Hill's railroad was one of the few railroads that ever consistently operated in the black. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. Thank you, Pretty well. Hi, uh, I'm very intrigued by the uh, eight by eight square mile proprietary community. Um, I'm wondering if there are you looked at any approaches or strategies for how to get those 64 square miles? I mean, is it just a matter of raising money to buy off the government, or you're not just basically leasing their land have to pay taxes? Or um, if anyone has any ideas about how you can actually get that property, would be great. Anybody? Anybody? There we go. Speak talk closer to the mic. Okay. Uh, actually, it might be coming sooner than you think. With the pigs with two eyes in Europe unraveling, um, you have the pigs meaning Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain. All of them are in terrible financial troubles. As I mentioned before, uh, Greece is selling islands right now, actually quite cheap. Uh, it's amazing just to you know, make up the budget def deficits that they have run. Uh, it's going to be worse. There's going to be a lot of opportunities in the very near term, it looks to me. And so uh, if one can come up with a very attractive price, and what they're asking for is actually very low, but if you raise the price a little bit, you might be able to establish sovereignty. And uh, I think it is very imminent that we might be able to do so. And it doesn't have to be a big area. Like I mentioned, all these areas are very small. The Hong Kongs is 
Singapore, all, the, all these things are very small areas. They go up into the sky. But they're great planned communities. I mean, entrepreneurial communities. They're wonderful uh, concept. Now, the reason we're doing that and not concentrating on the U.S. is, I think, to set an example more than anything. Because trying to work inside the U.S. politically to try to roll back all the laws that we have, and the piles of them, I guess there's rooms for them. It's going to be an enormous uh, enterprise to do that. I don't think there's any, anybody's going to give that up so easily. What will force them to do something, or companies <coughs> to do something, is when they get into trouble. I think they're all in trouble, deep trouble. And uh, I think, as I said before, every crisis uh, creates an opportunity. And as Obama says, never let a good crisis go to waste. So we should prepare. We should be prepared to make sure that we can do that. I'd like to make another comment, though, with regard to the proprietary community that we have today. Most of you have visited uh, Disney World, I presume, in Florida, more so than Disneyland. Disney World is a proprietary community, bar none. It's not only a small community, it's a county. They take care of everything except the tax collect. The government comes in just to collect the taxes. They have the private police, private fire, private everything. They have the opportunity to uh, consult with them on energy, F. Scott, and I was privy to go underground. If you want to see a proprietary community in operation, it is a wonder. Underground is the entire city planned out with everything. The waste disposal, the management of energy, the management of everything, it's all underground. They have their own irrigation district. They have their own roads, of course, their own police, fire protection. All of, all of it is organized. Now you may think this is kind of far-fetched because it's an entertainment park, but it is a real community. And all you have to do is cut off the, the government from collecting taxes, <laughs> and it's a true proprietary community. And so... Which, um, would, which would be a bonanza. <laughs> which would be a bonanza, <laughs> bonanza but then profit by getting the bureaucrats off their back and do it. But the bureaucrats are not interfering with them one way or the other. So it's there, it's here. And if, if you can't implement it here politically, let's set an example somewhere in the U.S. Amongst people see, you know, people say it can't be done. We have to have a government, a state, I mean. We have to have a state, what well, they call a government, of course. We have to have a government, after all, you know. My parents had a, had a government, everybody has a government, we can't do without. If you show, by example, like Thomas Paine did, that the, the alternatives to the king, the monarchies died, if there's alternative to the state, the state will die. Any more questions? Okay. Ask it from your seat rather than coming up here. I'm not supposed to take the microphone beyond the plane. Repeat the question when he says I'll, I'll do that. Yes. What's your question? Um, I'm curious to the extent that these eight square miles, would they be completely like self-sustaining or would they... Um, yeah. Would they rely on goods that come from outside of their communities? And if so, would there, could you possibly move away from using the national currencies of other countries completely? Ah, private money system. Private money. Uh, that's exactly the reason. Here, sorry. That's exactly one of the reasons why we might want to consider, at least in the beginning, to go outside, is to establish a proprietary sovereign money system, which it means individual sovereignty of money. One of the great things that the government, one of the bad things that the government did, they grabbed control, monopoly control of the money system. And that happened very succinctly, with very steps were involved. First the coinage, then the legal tender laws, and then the Federal Reserve System, which was in 1913, the de facto nationalization of all the banks. It was a monopoly situation by the government of issuing money. What I'm talking about, what I talked about yesterday, is the issue of money by producers only. It's a contractual arrangement. And it will be a true money because it will be backed by the goods and services of the people that issue the money. It will be individual sovereignty of money. And to establish that, we may have to go outside the United States. And as I said, it's virtual money. It's cyberspace money. So you don't have vaults necessary. You don't have gold there. You're not subject to hold up. Nobody's going to invade you if you don't have gold. It's all an entry of debit and credit bookkeeping book, book, uh, book system that, uh, that goes to the world. And like I mentioned before, $4 trillion being traded money-wise in any type of currency. You can go to dollars, you can go to you know, francs and euros, and it's all done. 
by computers. Just a couple of young guys actually sitting there, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Never stops, the bank never closes. The international bank is open all the time. Four trillion dollars a day today. What a tremendous business opportunity. And what a great thing to do, and this is why the ability to raise the money for a venture outside the United States is extremely large, <laughs> because you have businesses that you know, are unbelievable in potential uh, from a profit point of view, economically. Spencer, you have a comment on that. You already have a microphone. Yeah. I wanted to uh, comment. You asked me a moment ago about what, what developments had happened with, with this concept of a your private city. And the thing that I'm most impressed with was the idea that Al Loi came up with of uh, artificial root systems for a community. The idea would be to develop uh, all of the, the en ener energy management system involving all the uses of energy. Uh, uh, and this would be like an, a root system for a, a community. And Al proposed that it be developed and then leased to the community. And he would operate it or whoever owned it would operate it. And the incentives would be right there because it would be to his interest. To, he would have a, let's see, he would uh, uh, lease it for the, uh, for the costs. And then his profit would come from a, an equity interest in the entire development. So his interest would be to see that the entire development worked well, that it was successful, that, uh, that upgrades happened as were able. And uh, I thought this was a brilliant idea, and I've probably expressed it very poorly. I'd like to invite Al to comment on it. We are, we, we have, we're in the habit of thinking of utilities as, a, as sort of a community service that we buy and pay Edison Company, uh, AT&T, whatever. But when you think of the entrepreneurial community, it has to have a, its own roots. That's that somebody, every, everybody has to be someplace. But they ain't going to be someplace long unless they have sustenance there. So the energy and all aspects of energy become part of the ambience of the community. It doesn't function without it. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to sell, let's say, electricity, lighting, uh, on a fee-for-service basis. It's complicated and costly to do it that way. It's like subdividing it. It becomes part of the part of the structure of the community to enhance the environment, to improve the property, and to make it more profitable to operate with those amenities like air conditioning, like like good drinking water and good sanitary uh, treat, uh, function, and so forth and so on. So it becomes part of the community structure, and it and therefore it should participate in the equity in the in the growing asset value of the community rather than as, a, as an expendable for sale. Any more questions? Like to, uh, we have sure, yeah. Uh, while we have all these heavyweights like Spencer McCallum and others at the table, I think it would be useful to explain, for Spencer to explain, the heart of this concept is you do not subsidize land, you do not fractionalize the land, you do not divide the land. The value of keeping a large area of land under proprietary administration, that's the key to this whole concept. And unless you see why that is the essential element to make this thing work, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's just a grand concept, but it's very simple. And I think, uh, I think it would be useful for Spencer to, set, to answer the question, why not fractionalize, why not parcelize, why not cut up all the land, and what do we gain by not doing that? Well, under, under subdivision, as I said, it's not a, it's not a business, is it? A lot of consumers, they, uh, the land is in one title when the developer designs and creates the community. And he can do it beautifully because it's, it's in one title. He no sooner finishes it than he sells it off, chops it up, sells it off in pieces, 
and leave. Right. Leaving the, uh, the uh, occupants now who have bought these properties to fend for themselves the best way they can, and they have no option really except to develop a, a, a little voting government here. And, uh, and we've, there are many horror stories now about how um, um, homeowners associations work. Sometimes they work well, but you can't depend on it. And sometimes they work horribly. Uh, so uh, having a, uh, holding the title together in order to create a concentrated entrepreneurial interest in the success of the development on into the future as a long-term investment uh, it makes tremendous sense. And it doesn't, you don't have to think of it eventually becoming one world monopoly, a great big chunk. Uh, the, uh, I think the, the management size would be small and ownership of a corporation or something might be a, over a sizable, a sizable area. Yeah, but you would have an independent profit center. And I think that people's experience would be in small groups, essentially face-to-face -face communities like as in the primitive experience we've had in, in the anthropological literature with the manager uh, managing a, an area where he basically recognizes all of the people and, and deals with uh, and provides leadership and, and uh, and, and uh, 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 tenant selection uh, so that you have uh, compatible tenants and you get a synergy here you, you want to draw in tenants that will be uh, it will work well with others and so forth and uh, I think it's an exciting whole area in the future now I might say that since I mentioned the anthropological basis um, and Charles just passed me a little note how about the anthropological basis of the state the, uh, the pattern in prehistoric societies was one of really a voluntary society. <coughs> Internally, they were very strong. The, we have the idea of the, of the headman being the man with the big club and so on. And that's a totally fallacious idea. And in, in the uh, prehistoric communities, the, the headman was more like the chairman of a, of a committee or something or other. Uh, he, uh, so I like the experience of one uh, ethnographer who had been uh, doing field work with the Fox Indians. And he was, he was a young uh, a graduate student, and he'd been interviewing everybody and getting, finding out just what they did in the community. And finally, he was about to finish, and there was one old man over there he hadn't yet talked talk to. And he asked the fellow he was with, now what's that old man over there do? Or he doesn't do anything. He, he just keeps things going around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, with the rise of the state, it's a social pathology as I see it, that has uh, extended over the globe. And we might have some optimism about the future. Spencer Heath used to remark that health is more catching than disease. <laughs> and if that were not true, none of us would be here today. So we can hope that this Social pathology, and I like that what someone said, it's a, a pathology masquerading as its own cure. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. that's it, good. It, it may, it, um, we may well outgrow it. I think probably. I'd just like to comment that these guys have been advocating the idea of private cities and zero political state since 1964. <laughs> Um, we have another heavyweight over here, Mr. Fred Marks. This is not a question. question. I just thought Disney World. Walt Disney did not like the clutter around Disneyland in Anaheim. So he formed the idea of Disney World. He named it Experimental Project for the City of Tomorrow. 
and there is still now the Epcot Center, Disney World, which embodies that idea. And that one man was the, the heart and soul of the whole thing. Richard? Right. Oh, real. I have to keep it in front of us. Uh, this was probably a question mostly for Peter, but I would like anybody else's answer as well. With regard to creating in the imminent future a real proprietary community, uh, let's say by the purchase of a Greek island or any eight square miles anywhere on earth, what do you think are the prospects for the present political controller of that territory to relinquish their political control <laughs> at the same time they relinquish the land? Money. It, and that, that's the, I could have proposed that as the answer. If you think there's a, that with enough money, uh, they would relinquish that control, and in effect, that would become what, in in political terms, would be a new country. That, that's correct. Right? The, per the purchase of Alaska, sovereignty. Now there are other arrangements possible. Sure. You could go yeah. on the long term, forty but, years. But, but, Peter, the mic. Oh, Start over again. Sorry. There are other ways, of course, doing that. The cheaper and they are being offered, uh, you could establish a long-term lease situation, but it would revert back like Hong Kong. So you're running, running into that problem. Now, you might have accomplished your purpose, however, by uh, showing the example of how a proprietary community can rise out of nowhere, like Dubai, except proprietary uh, entrepreneurial community, excuse me. <laughs> uh, would arise and how it would function and the example would be worth almost the investment right there you would love to have sovereignty of course and if you can establish that that would be even better then you don't have to go back and revert back eventually to, to Hong Kong uh, to the Hong Kong principle so um, it's an alternative but I think it's coming and it's becoming very much available considering the world situation and I think it's just only really going to get much, much worse than it is today. Uh, Spencer, you have a comment? Yes, I'd like to comment on that. No, go ahead. Right. Now, I favor a long-term lease and for these reasons, uh, sovereignty is a very touchy issue. Politicians just can't touch it. It's, it's a hot potato, and to alienate part of your one's patrimony, this sort of thing, in this age of nationalism, all that kind of thing, it's very difficult. And it could be run back on, you know, and negated one thing or another. However, if you do a long-term lease, this is not threatening. And the long-term lease, in time, you could develop a tremendous uh, Dubai or something or other that would be um, that would be far more um, stronger and developed technologically in every way than the host country and after that there wouldn't be no it would be no problem really if you wanted to get sovereignty it would be there'd be no real problem now in in developing a small city like this you might say well how many how could you get people to come out and want to live there on a, on a rocky place where there's nothing there now? Things like this, you know? Uh, well, I don't see it developing that way. I would see it developing within uh, industry, uh, target industries first, uh, for which the location would be quite suitable. An industry, say a single industry would come in, they need personnel. The personnel would have families, they would need ancillary services, shopping and recreation and things like this. Each of these ancillary services in turn would have personnel who would require ancillary services. And I see in this way there would be a natural growth of a, an entire com complex community. So I see, well, that, that's how I, I envision this happening. It could be like Dubai, though. Yeah. Yeah. With investment, with the business coming in, like for example, it could be like the Dubai concept. Excuse me. Could be like the Dubai example, uh, except on a proprietary basis. Totally, uh, you establish a tourist industry, a banking industry, which I mentioned before would be huge in terms of uh, attracting uh, capital 
uh, and of course headquarters of corporations. They're always looking for the lowest possible place to invest, and they're doing that. There was a big article in the newspaper regarding uh, the corporation and headquarters moving to the lowest cost uh, property, uh, corporate-wise uh, place in Switzerland and in Liechtenstein, and they're moving there. They're actually really moving there in droves. Uh, they're all leaving their native countries and they're establishing there. So that, and then following up what you're saying, Spencer, the population would fall naturally. And so in order to do so, you have to establish the energy industry that requires, you know, water and electricity requires people. So it is a self-building thing and it can be very rapid. Dubai was built in a very short time on a very difficult situation. I mean, if you look at the story of Dubai, it's incredible what they did, what they did in terms of from, um, from an engineering feat, going out in the ocean with the palm, and uh, that was an engineering feat, unbelievable. They brought in the Dutch people, the best civil engineers they could find, and uh, it's incredible what can be done with private money. Yeah, I live in Escondido, and in the same time that they built the entire city of Dubai, they still haven't finished a stretch of freeway. <laughs> Bill has a question. I doubt we have any real political liberals in the room, so I'll have to speak for all of them, not that I am one. Someone wandering into this conversation would say, my God, you're talking about building enclaves for the rich with your own private armies to keep the poor away, and, and you're not going to share the water or the power. What? The masses will run around like a post-apocalyptic seen from Blade Runner or from, from Demolition Man. How, how do you answer that, that this is not just some solution for rich enclaves like Beverly Hills or Holmby Hills right here in California? We can't go in there because it's, you know, pretty much patrolled by people who say, what are you doing here? What is to prevent the, uh, 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 this, this giant polarization, as they imagine in today's political world, from occurring where the very wealthy have these proprietary cities and the poor are basically running around in what today is called anarchy or chaos? Jay, Mr. Snelson? to take that. Well, we have, in our time, probably everyone in this room, listen, uh, we saw Walt Disney, whose name has been brought up. Here's a man that had a vision, and everybody thought, this is crazy. And he very, he came very close to not making it. He had all of his personal wealth sunk into Disneyland. And it opened, and it was an instant success. But remember, it was wall-to-wall -wall naysayers. This will never work. This is crazy. No one's ever done this. And then we have Disney World. Have, how many have been to Disney World? Uh, the next time you're in Florida, go to Disney World. Or the next time you're in Orlando, because it is a beautiful example of a essentially a private enterprise community run by entrepreneurs that doesn't have crime problems, doesn't have any of these problems, and it's huge. And again, if it wasn't done, people would say, well, you can't do that. That's crazy. No one could do that. But it has been done. And who could have predicted this would be done? I couldn't have. But one man had the vision. Who goes there? Who goes where? Who patronizes it? The rich? Oh, yeah, right. That, and that, that, yes. Mr. Lowe, I said, yeah. who patronizes this place? The rich? Well, it's <laughs> there for the common people. And it's, it, it's, not, it's not so expensive that you have to be wealthy to go there. And so uh, we can't, one of the things we can't do if we believe in the concept of a free society and a free market, without any political state, it's impossible to predict how various things will come about in the marketplace, what will be the solution. The same thing is with money. Uh, we don't know exactly what might happen in a free society where there's free money. I'm not worried about it. The market will figure out any number of ingenious ways to do this. There will be c competing monies, doesn't matter. And uh, maybe somebody's got the solution now. Uh, uh, a lot of people here are working on the money concept. And so, would it? Maybe they've got a solution. Maybe they don't. But before that can happen, 
you have to be able to realize maybe there's a reason to have something beyond what we have now. If everybody says, yeah, but what's wrong with the money system now, you can't do anything. You can't offer an improvement when no one thinks there's anything wrong with what we got. And uh, so uh, you have to have confidence that if you can't figure out the solution, doesn't mean there isn't one. You see this all the time. I've dealt with this for 50 years. The guy, if he can't see the solution, there can't be one. Well, if that were true, there'd never be a solution to anything. Because most people don't see solutions to any major problems. And somebody else sees it, and somebody else solves it. But they don't. Well, anyway. Charles, you had a question. Charles. Maybe we could lease New Hampshire. David, you had a question. Yes. Uh, it seems to me that we are uh, kind of painting these as self-contained communities, and yet really it's going to have to participate in the global community. For instance, you know, let's say we have a technology company that, that you know, moves into this. Well, they would still want to buy file patents with the court systems in the, in the United States and Europe to be able to sell in those markets. And even if they, for instance, uh, paid money for a lease or something like that, well, they're really pre paying in advance taxation for the military's defense you know, of, of the state that they're participating in. So this isn't really as you know, independent on a global sense. So how would, a, how would an independent private um, city integrate with the rest of the world? Anybody? Peter? Integrate? Okay. Out of Hong Kong. <laughs> That's already being done. We have a lot of cities that operate quite freely. Singapore, all these people interface wonderfully. I mean, uh, it's all a matter of free enterprise, and free enterprise finds all kinds of ways of solving all kinds of problems. And I was giving him a little pamphlet. I Every pencil. one of you. Everybody seen I pencil? I hope mm -hmm. you all have read that. The most important document probably ever written by, again, one man in economics. If you ever think about the complexity of making a pencil, but not, not just making one by bureaucratic means, for almost virtually no price, because you can get a pencil for a penny. If you see the complexity and the people worldwide with their own ingenuity and profit motives interacting, this is the perfect example. Leonard Reed wrote, thought about it one night and wrote it up. I certainly urge you, if you have inclination regarding how things might work and how ingenuity of people can come together, it is a brilliant document that describes, number one, how people can get together, solve the problem economically, not just solving the problem. Everybody can go to the moon if you put enough money in it, but to solve it economically is a different thing. At the low cost, forming a pencil is just an enormous, uh, complex thing. It's worldwide interaction. And all the trades are done. Even the person that finally makes the pencil doesn't know how they even came together and how all these people interacted. So it's also a perfect example how central planning doesn't work. <laughs> it's a perfect example of anybody that has the audacity to think they can run a country or a state or a city or even a homeowners association. It's out of his mind. It just doesn't work that way. It's the interaction, the invisible hand, the profit motive, the regulator, natu the natural regulator that brings all these things together, makes all these things happen, and the marketplace will solve the problem for you. That happens with money, that happens with everything, it will happen with the free society. But we have to get people rid of the idea that the state is necessary. So one way or the other, we have to set an example, you can do it. Once people do it, then, you know, you can ask the question, who needs the state? I'd like to second that about the little, little essay called I Pencil. It's very entertaining, and I've often thought in teaching a course in anthropology or economics, it would be the first thing, reading, that I would offer the student. And it's short. I Pencil by Leonard Reed. I'll bet everybody in this room has read that. If not, you can download it on the internet. Um, I would just like to comment, finally, we're out of time. These ideas are presented of a zero state, 
and uh, private cities in an extremely organized and in-depth way in the V50 lectures. If you haven't heard these, please buy them. Um, at 4 o'clock, the next panels are um, private communities. Then at 4.45, letting a thousand free cities bloom. And finally at 5.30, a panel, I'd rather be in Libertopia. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. You, you had a quick statement, Peter? In view of the proprietary nature and the few places that are available uh, to pursue that, we have formed the Science of Freedom Foundation. Uh, it's the only organization I know of that is purely dedicated to putting together an authentic science relating to proprietary, total proprietary management of government services. And for any, any one of you who want to find out more about it, uh, it's just formed so we don't have major literature for you, but the issue is the integration, then dissemination of information, the third step will be for for-profit implementation concepts. And if you want to be in the distribution list, uh, please you know, take my card and I'll get you uh, uh, informed whatever future events will come about. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody.